Two years ago, several local rabbis launched an initiative that had been a long time in the making, New York City's first reform burial society, or Hevra Kadisha. Rabbi Joel Mosbacher of Sharei Tefillah, Rabbi Rachel Timoner of Beth Elohim, and Rabbi Alyssa Platkow, now of Westchester Reform, uh, were the founders. The Reform Hevra Kadisha is based out of Plaza Jewish Community Chapel, a nonprofit funeral chapel on the Upper West Side. A Hevra Kadisha, literally a holy society, is a group of volunteers that prepares bodies for burial. They wash, purify, and dress the body in shrouds. And Judaism teaches that this work is among the ultimate mitzvot, for the recipient will never be able to repay the kindness. And Jewish customs around burial stem from a line in this week's Torah portion. And it is a gory and unpleasant verse, unfortunately. But we read in Parashat Ki Tetze that if a criminal proven guilty of a capital offense is hung, his corpse must not remain on the tree or the stake overnight, but rather must be buried that very same day. Thankfully, Jews do not take law straight from the Torah, but rather from the Talmud and later legal codes which substantially limit capital punishment, restricting which crimes merit the death penalty, instituting steep requirements for evidence and witnesses, and setting extreme constraints on the makeup of a court that can impose a capital sentence to the point of a functional prohibition on capital punishment. But perhaps implausibly, this biblical verse and the notion that a person executed must be buried on the same day as his death is what sparks the Talmudic conversation about dignity and burial. Since a criminal needs to be buried on the day of his death, our sages extrapolate that kol v'chomer, all the more so must the rest of us be buried speedily. Traditionally, Jewish funerals happen as soon as possible after death. And in our modern world, with many families spread out across the country or even spread out across the world, this has gotten harder, but the basic notion persists. And Jewish tradition around proper treatment of a body is expansive. Kavod hametim, we call it, respect of the dead. Dignity after death means treating the body not as an empty vessel, but as a sacred receptacle, for it once housed the soul. The Talmud compares the human body to a Torah scroll, our two most holy ritual objects. Now, historically, liberal and progressive Jewish communities have not kept many elements of kavod hametim, so parts of this may be new to you but I believe that these traditions are worth studying on their own merits and as a microcosm of Jewish thought writ large. Because even if we don't take on every ritual component, this realm of our tradition makes visible a key Jewish value, which is companionship. In Judaism, ideally the, de the deceased is never left unattended. People, loved ones, volunteers, or paid workers, take turns doing shmirah, literally watching the body. Shmirah begins at the moment of death until the burial, and it is often arranged by the Hevra Kadisha, the burial society. And to be a shomer, a watcher of the dead, is a great honor. According to Jewish law, a shomer is exempt from all other religious duties including prayer, because she or he is actively engaged in another, even greater mitzvah. When we enter the world, there are people around us, a mother, loved ones, hopefully expert medical hands. And in Judaism, we are accompanied out of life too, with people beside us until the very end. Judaism hopes that we find companionship in all the moments in between birth and death, too. Lo tov cheyot ha'adam levado, we read in Genesis. It is not good for a person to be alone. A person is not meant to be levado, 
by himself. We need each other. And amidst the current American public health crisis of loneliness, we really need each other. Last year, the US Surgeon General issued a report that a full half of Americans are lonely and that loneliness has profound negative effect on individual health outcomes. And loneliness affects our societal health too. In a recent New York Times Magazine piece, Matthew Scher explains that when we talk about loneliness, we're also talking about all the issues that swirl perilously underneath it, alienation and isolation, trust, distrust and disconnection, and above all, a sense that many of the institutions and traditions that once held us together are less available to us or no longer of interest. Loneliness leads to purposelessness, distrust, political and religious radicalization. And the loneliness statistics are particularly grim for men. According to a 2021 study by the Survey Center on American Life, 15% of men say that they have no close friends. Among unmarried men under 30, a full one out of four lack a single close friend. The loneliness problem is most acute for young unmarried men. The male friendship recession, sociologists are calling it. From the very beginning, our tradition has insisted that this is no way to be it is not good for a person to be alone. We are meant to be with others, and romantic love is just one dimension. Joshua ben Parachia exhorts us, make for yourself a teacher and get yourself a friend. Rava insists, o chavruta o mituta, either companionship or death. And with a loneliness epidemic that is literally killing people, we see how true this is. According to the Talmud, the sages wondered why on Noah's ark, the birds were put together, the cattle were together, the creeping things were together, each after its own kind. Could the verse be hinting at a prohibition, against, <coughs> excuse me, a prohibition against mixing? Some fear, So in Noah's Ark, the birds are together, the cattle are together, the creeping things are all together. And the rabbis ask what this is all about. Is the verse hinting at a prohibition against mixing? Is there some fear of crossbreeding? Or maybe it's just practical considerations. You don't want the hawks next to the rabbits for obvious reasons. But no other sages reply. The reason was simply that animals tend to be happier with others of their kind. It was litzavta be'alma, merely for companionship, that the animals were with others like them. Merely for companionship, so that the animals could be friends. Even animals need company. And kal v'chomer, all the more so do we humans. Friendship, companionship, it's what we are all built for. And the Jewish burial society ensures that our beloved dead are accompanied up until their very last moments. Everybody receives accompaniment. People who were active in their communities and those who were not, those who were decent and kind and those who were not, people who were rich and people who were poor. In Jewish tradition, the deceased is clothed in simple, white, unhemmed shrouds. The Talmud explains why. At first, burial clothes varied widely, and the poor were embarrassed that their dead were buried in simple garments. And so the sages instituted that everyone should wear simple garments to equalize things and preserve the dignity of the poor. Similarly, an inexpensive pine casket for every person rich or poor, because death is the great equalizer. For every person, the Hevra Kadisha offers the same careful, loving care. 
There are three main steps. The physical washing of the body, spiritual purification done by pouring water over the body, and dressing the deceased. The members of the Hevra never turn their back on the deceased. Nothing is ever passed over the body. Immediate family does not attend. The Hevra Kadisha operate under strict confidentiality. Men prepare men's bodies for burial and women prepare women's. But this is only an outline. The specifics vary greatly. Some sprinkle soil from Israel on the body. Some cut nails, others don't. The liturgy the Hevra Kadisha recites varies widely. If you look at manuals from different burial societies, you will see an enormous range of practices. Much of the nuts and bolts of Kavod HaMaitim, respect of the dead, is the realm of custom, not strict law. Embedded in Jewish tradition is a recognition that when it comes to death, we restrain from prescriptiveness. If you ask clergy what Jews do around death, the answer will likely begin, it's customary to. Customary, rarely obligatory. And this isn't your liberal clergy trying to make you feel better. Other than death itself, there are few Jewish absolutes when it comes to death. Religious ritual exists to meet our needs. We try our best to honor our dead with the recognition that dignity takes many forms and what feels appropriate for the memory of each person will differ. And that is why having a reform Hevra Kadisha is so important. Our reform Hevra Kadisha signals that all people, anyone whose family asks for it, will receive accompaniment and dignified preparation for burial. We can serve the full spectrum of our city's liberal and progressive Jewish community, including our transgender and gender non-conforming loved ones. Liturgy is aligned with reform values. Rabbi Alyssa Platkow is even developing appropriate substitute rituals for non-Jews whose Jewish loved ones want the Hevra's help in preparing for burial. With the reform Hevra Kadisha, we can ourselves honor our deceased rather than outsourcing these sacred rituals. We can ensure that a person is accompanied to burial in a way that is aligned with the values by which they lived. The work of the Hevra Kadisha is difficult, physically and emotionally arduous. It is not for everyone. But for people who are equipped for this work, it is deeply rewarding, ensuring that the last hands that touch a body before burial are gentle, loving hands. And perhaps these hands could be yours. The NYC Reform Hevra Kadisha is looking for volunteers. Knowing Hebrew is not necessary. The key requirement for being on a Hevra Kadisha is commitment to carrying out its sacred work with respect and discretion. If you are interested in learning more, including the possibility of becoming a Shomer, a person who sits in the room with a body before burial, please get in touch with me. You can give me a call or an email. My email is emma.dubin at emmanuelnyc.org and I will put you in touch with the right people. I am truly so moved that dedicated leaders here in New York City have reintroduced these practices for the liberal Jewish community. This work is a chesed shel emet, a true kindness, and I hope that all who participate will find meaning and pride in this great, great mitzvah. Shabbat shalom.